Rebecca of Time Smith Dressmaking. Welcome back to my channel. I'd like to especially give a warm welcome to all the new subscribers in the last few weeks. This channel has grown so quickly after COVID, I'm utterly astounded. And if you really like what I'm doing here and what you see me working on, please could you subscribe and click the notification bell. This tells YouTube that this is a channel worth suggesting to other people who might be looking for information and research and sewing tips, especially for historical dressmaking. How is it September already? It's back to school time. So in the next month or so, while I'm recovering from tendonitis, we'll talk about some good books and pattern recommendations, especially for people who are new to this time period for sewing for the 18th century. We'll also have a look at how to set up your workspace especially given that this is a period that usually involves a lot of yardage. Starting off this week, I'm picking up on the question of gravity feed irons. There's a lot of interest in these and it comes up in sewing groups on a fairly regular basis and people want to know what are they, how do they work, how do you use them, with the basic question being, should I get one, right? Is it worth it? So in this week's video, I'm going to show you mine. I got it in April, so I've been using it for a bit over four months now. And to cut a long story short, I love it. I would never go back to a normal iron ever again. Should you get one? Well, it depends. If you use an iron as much as I do, virtually all the time, every day, like I do, yes, you should. <laughs> the bonus today in showing you how to use my iron, I will demonstrate how I prep linen sewing threads. Yes. I both wax and iron my threads, just as historical tra tailors did in the 18th century and earlier and up to the present day. I'll show you how I do it and explain why it makes such a big difference. So let's get started.
So I've had my iron for four months and I use it nearly every day. I think I've got to grips with its idiosyncrasies and how best to use it. Um, I find this an indispensable tool. Uh, ironing always is a good iron is always you know <laughs> nearly your best friend but this I'm pretty impressed with. So I'll walk you through just uh, how it's set up. Um, I've got the table, I've got a portable on uh, wheels kind of built up kitchen island sort of trolley that has been padded up. It's got a, a heat reflective layer underneath and then a couple of layers of uh, very heavily, very densely felted wool and then a plain muslin cover. Uh, so that can move around my workshop very easily and I normally use it with the water tank is up on the wall as I showed uh, before when we were setting it up and the plug is right here and normally while I'm working I have it arranged this way and I just walk right up and iron this way. but for filming because of all the fabric shelves here I've set it at right angles to that so that I can show you how I use it. First thing, power at the wall, so that's on. And then power on switch. Now it's not lit up because the dial setting is on off. So it's got settings zero up to five, five being the hottest. And I'm normally between four and five for mostly linens, occasionally cottons. Um, that will tolerate. So that's kind of my default is sort of pushing five and you can see the heat has come on. Now as this is all heating in this unit with water that has cold water that is fed up from the tank, fed down, I should say, fed down to the tank, it does take a few minutes for this to heat up enough to produce steam. If you don't need steam then you probably don't have to wait quite as long for it to get up to temperature. But I usually like to have that steam on tap so I go ahead and wait. Good time to sort up my materials at the beginning of the day or go make a cup of coffee. regular uses I have for an iron, any iron, is uh, to iron or press heat through my linen threads that I use for sewing. I always wax my thread with the quality 100% beeswax. Linen thread is naturally strong even when it gets wet. Waxing it smooths the fibers so that it um, copes better with the friction of pulling the thread repeatedly through fabric as you stitch. The more wax that you can get impregnated into the fibers and smoothed, the better. The better your thread will behave, uh, you get a lot less of uh, tangling, fraying, even breakage, or knotting, anything like that. Uh, the thread just behaves beautifully. I, I find an iron just makes such a difference. I can get away without ironing for very short lengths, but the minute we start dealing with a normal stitching length of so four, length of your arm, a bit more than your elbow is kind of what I do. And what I've done is I have a pressing cloth that is just long enough to enclose fully the lengths that I cut. So I use that as sort of my yardstick for the lengths that I cut. And I know that that is about the length that I would normally measure each on my arm for normal stitching. So I just go ahead and as it comes off the, the roll, you can see it's got a little bit of a curl. Wax will help that a little bit because it does smooth the fibers. But in waxing the thread, pulling it through, I rotate it very slightly with my fingers up here so that I can coat all around full length. of the thread and then I give it usually one full go. Now make sure it can spin freely so that it doesn't tangle a knot there and that just evenly distributes the wax on there. It does mean that the bit you've been gripping here sometimes doesn't have very much wax applied to it and 
I sometimes will then go ahead and just, just a little bit wax, but be careful to not be rubbing those fibers the opposite direction of the rest. Sometimes I wait till I'm actually threading the needle and then I very carefully wax the tip just as I'm, just as I'm threading the needle. But there's one. And on my pressing cloth, meanwhile, my, oh, my iron is just about reached temperature. I see the light has gone off. But I prepare these lengths, I usually do about half a dozen at a time. And depending on what I'm doing that day, whether I know that I'm going to be changing threads or whether I'm going to be using the same thread for a bigger project, like right now my, with my stays, I am doing boning channels, so I am doing lots of lengths of this thread, so I can really never <laughs> have too many prepped. As I get near the end of all those boning channels, I will then sort of estimate um, how many to do at a time, so I don't end up with a lot left over um, that I need to store somewhere. Oops, see I was a little bit careless and caught the thread underneath my thumb so that it created a little knot there. Given where it is, that it's so close to the end, I'm just going to trim that bit off. That was me being careless. So let it spin freely. And then stretch it out. Sometimes to release it, if the wax makes it a little bit stickier in, in your fingers, then you can kind of lay it down on your pressing cloth and press each end lightly so it should then grab the pressing cloth a little bit right i've got three prep there for this purpose as the iron has all heated up i'm going to go ahead and fold the pressing cloth back over it so i've got three lengths of thread in there coated with wax i don't really need steam for this but i like steam <sighs> steam on this iron is this button. Now, <laughs> did you see that? Woo! Woo! I can see it in the air. I'm not sure the camera's picking it up, but there's just clouds of steam coming out. Woo! Yeah, but it has just a very, very slight delay. You press it and there is like a split second delay before you get steam. Now the instructions say not to hold that button down more than 10 seconds at a time and I find that really a split second and as I press I might I will if I'm wanting continuous steam I will just tap that every few seconds instead of every seven eight seconds something like that um, this does get heavy hold it up with this these are heavy irons but it's the weight of them that makes pressing on large lengths of fabric, on huge lengths of fabric, just, just starting a project, it's the weight that does half the job for you. That and the abundant steam. I mean, you're coming from a, what is it, a cool, I don't know how many liters tank, water tank up there. You've just got, in, you've got <sighs> amazing amounts of steam. When I started four months ago, I put, I filled that tank half full, just half, and I've only just recently had to then top it up again, back up to the half level. I'm not filling it all the way to the top because I'm just a little bit nervous about climbing up there on a ladder uh, with uh, the amount <laughs> holding the weight. Um, I'm not particularly strong and my balance is not particularly good. So, but four months, four months, that was a lot of use. The other thing about the instructions I'm told is to not rest it like this, like you know, with normal iron. And it's kind of, that electrical base is kind of at an angle, to, kind of discourages that. So if you try to do it like that, it the weight, doesn't really want. Anyway, we're ready to iron. So I've got a bit of, if it's been sitting for a little while, because there's water in the system that just sits there in the hose, if it's not feeding through regularly, I do give it a good flash just to kind of clean it. Whoa, do you see that? That's holding it down for about two seconds. I'll do it again. And we're getting quite a lot of sizzling, which suggests to me that there's a little bit of residue on the, on the protective plate that I did manage to fit to rambling a bit but basically here we go it is once you're using it it is just like an iron now i'm wanting to smooth the fibers and remembering that my cut edge is at one end so that's kind of the head that's going to be the head, the end of the threads that feed into the needle and slice the fabric now i will go ahead and give it a little bit of steam now if you apply your steam 
relatively early once it's been heated up and you haven't kind of cleared the jets or checked to see if they might need any clearing, um, it will sometimes leave the pools water. But I'll tell you, the thing is so hot, it just, that water, you just iron it right out, iron it dry in a few seconds. It's no time at all. Okay, this silicon rest plate is where it lives, even when it's hot. I have got an extra pad of a folded up piece of that heavily felted wool, um, just as extra. <laughs> I don't even know that it's needed, but it just makes me feel a little bit better that it's there. So here are my threads. And all the curl is basically gone now. And the wax, you can't feel any excess waxiness really on the thread. That wax has been pushed through into the fibers. So now as it's being pulled through your fabric, it will continue to kind of reinforce that smoothing action. Um, I don't get any tangling or breakage now that I press as well as wax. I, I, I waxed alone on its own for years without ironing and then read about this and I thought, oh, that sounds a bit fiddly, that sounds a bit time consuming. And then I thought, I, I, read, I read somewhere and I don't even remember where that tailors in the 18th century and probably other, many other periods too, that the irons that they use and the system they use, that they would make a whole bunch of pre-cut lengths all ready to go and then do all their pressing of their threads at once so they would have a little stock. And then I understand that then they could collect them together and twist or, or do a figure eight to create a skein, a small skein of yarn, like what you get with embroidery threads. And that would be all of their sewing threads all prepared and they'd be able to keep track of which was the um, uh, threading the needle end and which would be the tail. So they'd know which way direction it's coming through the fabric. So that's three there. Um, couple more notes about the iron itself. It does sit there and stay hot all day. It doesn't go any hotter. I don't think that it, um, there's any danger of it going like dangerously hot. It does switch itself off. That is a thermostat. So it will stay to that optimal temperature and it will switch off when it reaches that temperature and then back on again to keep it there. So you can go away, do other things and come back an hour later, two hours later and it's still there at your optimal temperature. Um, that's something that's not, that's not recommended for a standard iron. Do bear in mind that while it's got this coating that protects your hand when you use it, the whole unit does get quite hot and stays hot. So when you put your hand here, you can feel the heat radiating off. And so if you bear that in mind, get used to it. And remember, only grip the handle and to just be aware that the other bits, that bit is actually quite cool, that's fine. That's cool. So it's basically, I'm feeling the heat radiating from up from the iron itself. Yeah, that plate bit, that's a bit hot. Um, that's it really. They're just, they're amazing. They're amazingly simple. If you get a good brand, a reputable brand like Silver Star is and Sapporo, I think Sapporo is, um, then a lot of the parts over time, if they start to just wear out or, or, or play up a little bit, these are all replaceable and they're quite straightforward just by anybody with a little bit of basic common sense and knowledge of mechanics and a little bit of crafts of electrical goods. You basically switch everything off, of course, and I haven't done this yet myself, but I do know, I've researched that these parts are, you can get aftermarket, you can get, um, sorry, after sales. So they are original brand, they are completely compatible um, you're not voiding a warranty or anything by doing that. And um, basically the thing can last forever. Can you say that for a normal iron? They're not that expensive either. They're somewhere in the around. You can find them, you know, sort of give or take 10%, you know, in the $100 to £100 kind of range. I got this from America and I paid all the import duty and charge and everything like that. And I reckoned that if I bought but it's still all told, the total of it came to about the same as the price of maybe two, no more than two, uh, decent quality standard type irons, which I typically, the kind of use I put them to, they don't last more than a year. So something here that could last me 10 years has paid for itself within two. And 
and it, the job it does is just it's remarkable so i would hand over heart absolutely wholeheartedly i would absolutely recommend these um it's worth every penny and it's not it's not that expensive in the first place so if you've been thinking about it now you can get them you do need to pay attention to voltage and that's why in the filming in the shots that i've taken of this i have stressed voltage that if you buy a machine that's all wired up and the solenoid tells you what it's powered for what voltage um you may need a voltage converter that actually switches from one currency to another um, but even if you've got the right current strength you might need also a plug adapter which is what i've got because silver star they come in 110 volt for the us and i believe canada uses 110 as well but europe and the and the uk we have 220 <laughs> yes 220 volt so these come you can get them um, and they should say right in the listing wherever whatever online shop you're using they should say which voltage they have uh, if it's 220 then they come with a european plug not a uk plug so that's where my it's an eu to uk adapter um, but that's just a plug adapter it is the right current the right voltage um, and that was essential i, I would have cost me and you know another up to 100 pounds for a voltage converter if i had bought a us powered version which for a long time i thought that was the only thing i was going to be able to find so i was really really pleased when i found this one in a reputable brand there are some other brands out there that ship directly from china and things and i just didn't really know how reputable they were but silver star is good uh, i think there's another one called gold star and i don't know if they're related to companies or not but this is silver star and brilliant thanks for watching i hope you found that interesting and helpful if you have any more questions about them anything i didn't cover please pop them in the comments below and thanks again for watching i am astounded at how quickly this channel has grown thank you for making that happen as a new channel i'm at kind of a critical make or break point as to whether youtube puts any of my videos in front of more people who might be searching for information about historical dress or costuming. I'd love to get my channel in front of more people who really love this as we do. So many people don't even know that there's a, a historical costuming community already on YouTube. You can help tell YouTube that I am producing good quality content and that my channel is worth cross-promoting to potential new viewers by watching videos all the way through when you can. I know that some are long, so feel free to save to a playlist and come back when you can, because you, YouTube notices that too. YouTube wants to promote videos that it sees viewers actually watching. So if people start watching a video and then they stop, or click out, switch to something else, YouTube can think, hmm, must not be a very good video. Also sticking around through ads if you can helps build a channel's credibility with YouTube. And that brings me to ads. My channel is now monetized. I can tell YouTube which of my videos they can put ads against. I do not let them just throw ads at any and all on my channel. And I can also say where in the video I'm happy for ads to appear, the beginning, the middle, the end. Now, I personally, as a viewer, really don't like mid-roll videos. So any video that I allow ads on, I always say just at the front or possibly also at the back, but never in the middle. But meanwhile, I have no control over what ads appear, what the content and who the ad creators are. I don't get any advance notice, much less any sort of approval power. Uh, I understand that if there's something that is um, really objectionable, that I can block certain ad creators. So. Bear that in mind, if you see something appearing, an ad on my channel that you think just feels wrong, please let me know about it and I will try to track that down and get that stopped. So all that said, there's been a lot of changes, uh, especially for a, a new channel where I'm learning the basics still as well. I really hope you enjoy watching. I'm trying to keep to a weekly schedule, so new videos come out on Thursdays, usually in the evening, UK time. And on that note, I hope to see you next week. Bye for now.